thank you. Welcome to all of you. Um, as said, it's uh, it's an interesting topic. Uh, certification in times of COVID-19. Um, uh, with me are uh, Chris Mahler from ESME and John Gaylor from AWS. Our idea is to give in the next 45 minutes a comprehensive or as far as we can tell a view on uh, what's happening in the certification and accreditation world in these uh, times of COVID. To sum up our topic, um, of course, due to the, the pandemic, uh, the way organizations service customer certification has had to significantly alter direction um, from a sometimes um, remote auditing job. It's uh, been mostly a remote auditing job and we're struggling, of course, with the, 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 the different aspects it brings to us. And um, uh, as not all certification processes could uh, see through, uh, there has been made some tough decisions on how to move forward with their respective certification business. So um, what we can say with the three of us, with me, uh, John and Chris, we, we're all in a different segment of the market, so to speak. So um, I'll just, try to give you an overview of uh, what's happening at NEN. Yeah. And for all of us, it's it's the when you look at it, we have all the, the, the same challenges, how to maintain business continuity, um, how to it's 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 easier said than done in practice, how to replace on site activities with remote activities when um, uh, systems are not always working when cameras are not always working. How do you put how do you set through an, uh, an audit process and what is allowed uh, in terms of uh, certification accreditation processes and rules and of course what is feasible and what is uh, practical available. Uh, specifically uh, turning to uh, the perspective of NEN. Uh, uh, just uh, to be clear, we are not a, a certification body. We're not a conformity assessment body. Uh, of course, we're a standard development organization. We are a publisher. We provide training courses, uh, examinations on some trainings. Uh, and of course, we ha also have the on offline issue on, on that part of our business. But what I would like to um, point out today to you is the business we have on uh, scheme ownership, which means that NEN develops and manage, uh, manages certification schemes um, to help uh, the, the conformity assessment body do their work in a unified way. And uh, what's interesting to see is that the main business we have as a scheme owner um, is actually in the healthcare sector uh, in regard to quality um, uh, to management systems, quality management systems, sorry, and of course information security management systems also specifically for the healthcare sector. So two um, uh, parts of our business uh, which have, of course, now, um, yeah, well, an immediate impact uh, with the relation into the healthcare sector. What happens if, if you look at um, the rules of certification and accreditation that we have to deal with or uh, follow, um, the first thing we do is look at our Dutch Accreditation Council and then we go up, you have the European Accreditation Group and of course in the end on top of it you have the International Accreditation Forum, the EIF. And um, the schemes that we own or the schemes that we develop are all under the vision of uh, the, the Accreditation Council. So we have to deal with the documents uh, of EIF, AI and uh, the RVA, the Dutch Accreditation Council. Uh, of course, since long there has been documents uh, that 
relating or working on extraordinary events or uh, if you look at the MD4 mandatory uh, document uh, document for the use of information uh, for auditing purposes, especially when dealing with remote audits. Uh, the interesting is, is that everybody nowadays looks at the EIF web website uh, since the frequently asked questions have arrived there looking for answers on how to deal with uh, the accreditation rules being a certification body or yeah, as we see it in our position. And what's interesting is that um, on a, um, a land perspective, on, on uh, the spe specifically looking at uh, the Netherlands, our uh, RVA, the Dutch Accreditation Council, only in the first week of November, published a document on how to deal with uh, COVID. Yeah, it was an extra document on uh, how to deal with the extraordinary events. So looking at what we have seen in Holland, um, we had the first wave of COVID between March and I would say the end of June. Then of course they had a sort of in-between period until the end of September. And we went into a sort of lockdown, uh, a light one, so to speak, since the beginning, I think the 12th or something of October. And all that time, there has been discussion, um, feedback going forward, backward on how to deal with rules in times of COVID. And in the end, since November, we've got a, we've got a vision on that uh, for, from our own Dutch Accreditation Council. The interesting part is, and um, they, they try to seek answers for all different uh, um, perspectives, all the different um, uh, lines of business that, that are happening right now, um, which is interesting is that they made seven scenarios. And as NEN, uh, uh, as a scheme owner, we try to find out, okay, which of the lines we need to follow in our schemes. And of course, if you look at the scenarios, what is interesting is they the, the, the first one are uh, the client doesn't carry out any activities or is only uh, carrying out a part of the activities. So it's not so much uh, on, on the on the scope of the or on the activities of the conformity assessment body. But if there's no organization to audit, we all have a big problem. Yeah, the organization has a problem, but of course the audit cannot be um, uh, executed. Uh, when the conformity assessment body does carry out activities, you have a number of issues. Uh, maybe you're not allowed to go there, um, which gives directly the, the question, can we uh, perform the audit in another way? Uh, maybe there's a higher risk to health and safety because of the uh, because they have a higher risk uh, because of the, uh, uh, the activities they perform in relation to uh, COVID. Uh, what we also see is, uh, for instance, me as um, uh, as uh, um, being Dutch, I'm um, not allowed to go into Canada anymore and a couple of other countries. So uh, sometimes we're not allowed to uh, go to the organization in the country that we want to or that we need to go to audit the organization. Um, and of course, there can be restrictions uh, because of there's a, because of COVID being actually in the organization. And the seventh one is for us the most interesting uh, because they made a kind of an exclusive um, uh, uh, scenario for organization which have an increased workload related to COVID-19 and which is especially uh, 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 related to uh, the healthcare sector, so to speak. So what we try to find out is, okay, what are the measures we have to take dealing with the scenarios or some measures, sorry. And the interesting part is that uh, John and Chris can elaborate uh, some more on the things uh, they see in practice and the measures they have taken. Of course, the first rule is uh, we have to make a risk assessment if the audit objective can be achieved. And um, regarding time, I will I won't go into the details, but of course, if you're if it's an initial audit, you have 
other issues than if you've already been there and it's just a periodic or a, a, a monitoring audit uh, where you're much more aware of how the organization looks like. Um, so depending on the goal you want to achieve, uh, you have to give an answer on, can I achieve my audit objectives? If not due uh, being uh, on the premises, maybe we can use alternative media uh, met methods. Of course, uh, video conferences and um, mobile cameras. But of course, what's interesting is that uh, more and more we can um, just uh, s uh, go into the systems of an organization and see documents on servers or whatever. Of course, they have to be taken some uh, measurements to make that uh, possible. But the idea is that um, you don't only have to um, trust the, uh, the, 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 the images you see, but we're also working with uh, the documents which they can send or which they can open during the audit. Um, well, the, 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 an easy one is of course to use additional protective measures uh, like we all see day to day wearing your face mask and, and stuff like that. But even then it's often not allowed to go into all the officers or visitors are seen as a, as a, as a risk are uh, being in a certain office or dealing with certain people. Um, when when there is an un, when you're not able to travel to the country, of course you it's 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 a very simple sentence to seek um, cooperation with local uh, conformity assessment bodies. But the issue with certification is always on the competence of the of the auditor. So, uh, in what way are you um, uh, measuring, monitoring, uh, uh, being sure that the cooperation that you have will not affect? If you look at the first ballot, uh, uh, the audit objective. So that's a that's a difficult one. Do we have people on the ground in the country? that we want to audit and do they have the correct competence? It's a, it's a, it's a difficult discussion. Uh, of course, there's always the possibility, if you look to the next bullet, to postpone the audit with six months. Um, our own accreditation council is quite strict on it and it has given us, for example, in Holland, a direct issue uh, that the COVID uh, started in March if you take six months and the rules from uh, the accreditation council came out in November, we have an, uh, a direct problem with some of the certificates being um, uh, being given. Um, so that's uh, a big discussion now in Holland. Uh, how does it work with the six months? Because uh, if you can't perform the audit during those six months, you come in a situation as a conformity assessment body where you don't want to be. You can't perform the audit, you have to reduce the scope of the certificate or even suspend or expire the certificate, which gives a lot of difficulties when, let's say, somewhere in the beginning of next year, uh, the, the, the process of certification is maybe much easier because of lightening of uh, measurements. The, 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 yeah, the, the, the aspect working in our advantage, so to speak, for NEN is uh, when I told you about the scenario seven, which was especially for, well, if, 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 if you see how it's written for the healthcare sector, um, there is an extra six months uh, given uh, an, an additional suspension of all the uh, activities up to one year in total. So for us, we hope that will be enough uh, to 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 uh, to give us time as to March uh, 2021 to to get into a more normal regime again and uh, visit because it's very difficult to visit a, a, a healthcare uh, organization in, in these times, but to visit them again and to have an actual audit. But um, 
um, in, in, in Holland, in, in these times of certification process, it's, it, there's a lot coming to our way, probably to your way as well. Um, but to, to set through the, uh, the certification process gives a lot of uh, difficulties, as you can see eh, in the measures and the, and the scenarios that are being given. Um, uh, that's nice. This is already my last sheet, so I think I'm, I'm right on time. Uh, what we see in Holland for the for the future ahead, um, I have a question here. No technological, uh, technological, sorry, solutions accepted and here to stay. Well, I think you can skip the question mark as we see it from our perspective. Uh, the new technological solutions uh, will be the new way to to deal with uh, uh, conformity assessment bodies. Maybe not 100% remote, but more and more uh, we've seen the advantages of what it can achieve. So we can, we can make a more uh, equal balance between the advantages of remotes and uh, on-site. And of course, our, our main goal in the end, working with conformity assessment bodies, uh, developing schemes, is to uphold the claim that conformity assessment will demonstrate, and of course, uh, uh, with certification bodies through the eyes of an independent third party, that spe specified requirements are fulfilled. And that's in the end, that's the promise we make with certifications, with the certification process. So just um, as an introduction, on the issues in Holland and the issues with uh, certification and accreditation, um, I give over the mic to Chris, I think. Thank you, Renee. My name is Chris Mahler. I'm the Director of Global Program Certification for ASME. And I am, as Renee said, working with Renee and John on this presentation. ASME Conformity Assessment does a little over 1,800 on-site audits per year. Long before COVID hit, probably about three years ago, we started looking into doing virtual audits. So when COVID did hit, it really was a catalyst for us to really um, stop thinking and start moving forward. This was really important, especially to ASME's customers because our customers are mandated by law to have our certification. If there's a certification in the lapse if there's a lapse in the certification program, you know, there's a lot of very serious ramifications that can happen to them. They have to shut down their manufacturing, their shipping and their receiving gets impacted, and basically people's work comes to a grinding halt. We also have a lot of people that are involved in audits that we have to deal with, and that's usually one to four people on the ASME audit teams. We have between five and 30 people from the company's uh, quality assurance departments that we need to work with. We also need to work with the authorized inspection agencies as well as the national board. So when looking at how we're going to work uh, virtually, excuse me, the challenge was just trying to figure out how we're going to schedule and sync all these groups together, plus find the technology that's going to satisfy everybody's needs. On February 26th, we stopped traveling for all ASME employees and our auditors. And uh, by April 30th, we had procedures in place that were ratified by our Board of Conformity Assessment for conducting virtual audits. The first step that we uh, had to take within developing uh, procedures was to, to build a program for the auditors for virtual uh, certification. We had to determine what was acceptable really when we were scheduling a virtual audit and if we couldn't, what were the corrective measures that we were going to take to make this work. We also had to look into a lot of different factors that would allow us to do a virtual audit and determine what was mandatory for the applicant. What did we have to have and what did they have to do? What was secondary in importance? And finally, was there a workaround for certain items that we didn't deal as important to, to work with at that moment? Key items that we had to agree upon was that the applicant had to have a basic knowledge of video conferencing as well as be able and willing to share large files in multiple formats. It sounds kind of logical, but most of our, cus our customers are in third world countries or are in very remote locations throughout the globe where um, Windows 98 is considered still cutting technology. 
Um, we also had to come to an agreement on were they able to uh, have the proper internet capability to handle streaming at a minimal with minimum service interruption. We determined that the companies needed internet connections of at least 225 kilobyte, uh, kilobits, uh, kilobits per second. And for video conferencing call, they had to have a dedicated line with at least 200, uh, 200, 270 kilobytes per second. That would give us the most optimum uh, vision back and forth between the companies. We also determined that uh, if they were using a microphone to get back to uh, discuss things with us and our auditors, they had to have something that had a uh, ample frequency range of at least 600 ohms or below. Otherwise, there was going to be degradation in the uh, uh, communication. And really, one of the key aspects of this was being able to have clear communication throughout this four or five day process. From an ASME uh, perspective, when dealing with the technology, we put all these parameters together, not only for the um, for the applicant, but also for ASME. There are an awful lot of rules that we had to um, put together. But the one thing that we had to really um, take into account when looking at uh, different platforms uh, were all platforms weren't created equal. So when we looked at tools, it wasn't um, necessarily finding the best tool on the market. What we really needed to find was what was the best tool in dealing with our situation. And again, it was important because there were so many different, there's so many different bells and whistles now on all these tools. You know, what is needed? What is not needed? What becomes too complicated? So after looking at several tools, and we looked at quite a uh, quite a bit, we uh, we actually settled on Zoom as a main meeting communication option. There really come a, several reasons for doing that. the The main reason was it was straight. It's straightforward. Our auditors are older; they're in their mid sixties, early uh, early seventies. So they're 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 old. They need something that was going to be easy to use, something that's very portable within the within the uh, within the field that they can. Uh, use from anywhere on the globe because we have them stationed in uh, 32 different countries. We also had to make it easy enough for our customers that are in remote areas in third world countries where technology is really not that great, they would have an easy access to be able to set up the program within their own facility so that they could um, operate and be receptive of these audits. We also didn't want to spend an awful lot of time ramping up and training. We wanted something very simple and very straightforward, and that's what we found with uh, with Zoom. It also gives us the ability to share uh, data very easily and information back and forth in real time. Uh, and also, one of the key aspects were that it was able it's able to work on a, a many different types of tools such as uh, smartphones, tablets, PCs, and, des and desktops. Really, almost any type of um, computing device where we're, we find that we're able to uh, integrate with very, very easily. It also gave us whiteboard option. Whiteboard is very important to us because it gives us real time uh, mapping. That allows us to see and do things with the customer when they're on site and we're 5000 miles away. So really key reasons for looking at this were being able to move documents back and forth very, very easily and securely. 50% um, of our audits at this point are really due diligence through um, looking at the documentation that's coming back and forth. So that was a very uh, important necessity for what we needed. And again, there are great tools out there. For us, Zoom was just very, very easy and it was easy for our customers. So after we put all this information together, we were able to start rolling out this program by May 1st of this year. So far, uh, it's been very, very successful. We've done from May 1st to uh, last week, we've done 200 virtual audits on site, each one lasting approximately four days with anywhere from six to 25 uh, people being involved in it. We have 100 different, uh, we have 100 additional on site audits that are scheduled between now and the end of December. And what we have found is 
the restrictions on COVID have been uh, loosened up a bit in some parts of the world. So we do give people the option of, do you want an on-site or a virtual audit? At this point, about 40 or 45 percent of the people who have the choice are selecting virtual audits. 79 percent of those people or those companies that are going to go undergo a virtual audit um, are opting to take a 30-minute virtual training session that we give within conformity assessment. The primary reason why we give this really quick tutorial is to make sure that any technical issues prior to the audit are corrected so there is very very little downtime once the audit actually begins. Um, time is money especially when dealing with audits and the way that we work with these organizations. So there are some things that really we needed to consider and things that people who are looking at large scale virtual audits that need to really be, um, I, I guess, reviewed and uh, taken into account. The first thing is that uh, without a doubt, cost should not be a driving factor when looking at the technology it, it, because prices are all over the place. Um, sometimes the most expensive tool does not give you the most expensive return on investment. The driving decision with this really was um, what is going to be the best, easiest, and most reliable tool that we can provide our customers at this time that we have the ability to control. Also, dealing with the proper link requirements and the proper platform that meets code requirements, a lot of these, uh, a lot of the things that we do, there are rules. Every company has rules on how they deal with data and data exchange. Uh, so that was very, that's a very important uh, aspect to consider when looking at the technology is can the customer do it and are you as a company, are you allowed to do it? Uh, we had to go talk with our legal department and by doing that and finding out what we can and can't do legally save us a lot of time and aggravation because nothing can tie you up more than a lawyer. <laughs> Also, we need to determine the level of video and video connection and the minimum resolution that we would find acceptable when doing virtual audits. Um, essentially, acuity is king. If you can't see it very clearly, there's a chance that there will be a problem with it. We looked at, uh, we, are, we, we use uh, the parameters right now of the United States Air Force uh, 1951 standard for uh, visual acuity. It's a test that gives you the ability for photographs and pictures to be distinguished by a set of bars separated by one arc minute, and that determines the clarity. If you can see that bar underneath some underneath through a smartphone or a camera, then that gives us the approval that we will have clear sight into uh, what we're looking at during the actual audit. Also, um, we need to be able to record video and still photography uh, so that we can maintain uh, verification and document uh, documentation. So we had to go find something that was really going to work within those different parameters. Um, and also we needed to select uh, something that was going to work where you should really look at something that's going to work with many different types of platforms. Being pigeonholed into one basically is a failure because I guarantee no matter what you do or what you look at, if it covers 10 things, you will run into a client that's going to have number 11. That's you still using something like a Wang computer from 1988. And when looking into other uh, items in a shop, you need to make sure that whatever you have has auto focus on your smartphone or tablets. You really can't rely on what you're seeing and if anybody uh, believes that they can all they really need to do is look at go back to your parents house and look at the photos they took of you and your siblings in 1972 and look at how fuzzy they were and I'm sure the guy taking the picture thought that he was an Ansel Adams at the time. So really this slide sums up very quickly, I know I went through it quickly to try to uh, make up a little time here, but this kind of sums up some things that were important that we found important in the consideration of looking at this. Uh, and I, the one thing I did kind of skip over, which I shouldn't have, unfortunately, is 
no matter what we did, the only thing that we are mostly concerned about in in doing all of this is what is the safety level for our auditors as well as the customers. So that took 90%, that was about 90% of the decisions that we made is making sure that they were safe. Uh, because realistically, if they weren't, it's very easy to, for us to issue extensions for their certificate, but it's not very easy for us to explain why we allowed someone to get ill. So when dealing with um, virtual auditing, the one thing that we have found is uh, communication is the key. That is very, very uh, important. Also, the tools can be interchangeable, but the one thing that really we needed was something that had night mode vision. So we preferred to use Apple computer, uh, Apple Apple smartphones. And the reason is that they have uh, a very clear uh, night mode, especially because we have problems in factories where the lighting is absolutely terrible. And this does give us the acuity that we need. We look at, we hope, to have the auditors using something between an 11 Pro Max or the 11 or 12 series. We also found in these cases that the Samsung Galaxy Note 20 has a very nice large screen, AMOLED display with a 2400 by 1080 pixel resolution, which also gives us an amazing picture to take a very close look at welding, rolling, cladding, whatever we're, whatever we're investigating at that time. However, we have found limitations to every technology that we looked at. Uh, everything has its plus and minuses. The thing that really helped us out is understanding the limitations of the technology and working within those boundaries for ourselves and allowing our customers to work within those boundaries. It also helped us develop some new ideas and ways, ways to work or smarter and around other um, events that we never even thought about. And uh, finally, the key to all this really was uh, the technology is great. Uh, all these things are great, but it was all it's all about communication, especially when dealing with virtual auditing. There can be absolutely no gray areas. Everything's got to be black or white. We need to say what we mean and mean what we say and uh, make sure that the customer understands that all facets had to be clearly understood. And if they're not agreed upon, we don't do the audit until they are. Miscommunication will kill a program faster than any terrible technology that you look at or you bring in. So it, it, it really became, we had to be much clearer in our conversations and much more concise than we had to in the past when we were on site. And finally, this is working well. We know we have a long way to go. We really do believe that we'll be able to improve on this, but at this point, our customers want it, so we're looking at continuing to use virtual uh, audits after the pandemic goes as giving our options a choice. Because the one thing it does do is it does help minimize some of the costs because of the travel that we're no longer expending to go to these sites. And as long as our quality maintains at the same high level, we see no reason to change or, or to go backwards at this point. And I know I really rushed through that and I appreciate your attention. Uh, that's all I have. And I would like to thank you all very much. And with this, I'm going to pass this to John Gaylor from uh, American Welding Society. Okay, thanks, Chris. Um, I do actually see a question out there from uh, Ahing out there, if you wanna maybe uh, um, jump in there and actually address Chris. He said, uh, even after we go back to the new normal of the uh, new adaptations, what do you think um, will carry over with you into the, the next stage for ASME accreditation? We're, we're gonna carry over this, but we're going to enhance the process. We're gonna streamline it and we're gonna make it better. We're also going to continue to give our, our customers the choice of on-site versus, um, versus virtual. Neither one is going to go away but we see that this will just make each one or each uh, audit method better and stronger in the future. And again, it does give people one options, and this is an option that clearly is going to benefit people because it will lower the costs and it does streamline it and it becomes less intrusive. Uh, one thing I have to point out to people, uh, 
the reason why it becomes less intrusive is because we're one of probably 45 companies that come into these organizations every year and audit them. So if we can kind of take away from them, not from from if we can take away them doing audits to get back to work, everyone's really happy. Very good. Um, so my name is uh, John Gaylor. Um, I work with the American Welding Society and I oversee our certification programs um, and our our company um, certification programs as well, which we uh, um, we we do accreditation programs. So I'm going to go over a, a few things and I'll give you a kind of a um, an overlay of AWS and where we kind of sit in the uh, the world of certification and accreditation. Um, so in the past 10 years, um, our peak year as far as certification goes uh, and we do we do prep training and we do certification exams, so personal certification exams. Um, our peak year, we did uh, exams and prep seminars in over 44 countries. Um, um, that particular year, we did uh, had more than 10,000 people go through our programs, and um, many of those assessments are multi-test assessments. In that peak year, we did uh, um, over 45,000 assessments um, during that period. So, give kind of give you a, um, a feel for the scope of what we actually do out there. Um, um, we did actually not. Uh, I, I don't have a lot to tell you on the technology side, like uh, Chris actually told you on the accreditation side, but I can actually show you. Um, how COVID actually affected our organization uh, during that period of time. And a couple of little things that we actually did uh, during that period of time with prep courses, our exams, um, how it actually affected our certification programs, um, retention rate, um, what we did to pivot really quickly on some of our online programs, um, particularly our online prep courses, um, and very quickly uh, how it affected our uh, company certification programs as well. So the first thing um, I like to go over is our in-person events, um, our seminars and our prep courses. Um, um, so we have the the law, the kind of a wide breadth of areas where actually we do. Um, so domestically, we, we basically shut down all of our prep courses starting uh, mid-March, um, just like a lot of organizations here, um, and didn't actually open them up back until until June. Um, and and we, we took a lot of um, thought into opening up those, those live sessions. Um, we did come out as a stance as an organization and state that we are an essential um, organization supporting essential businesses out there. And, and we felt that actually certifying individuals um, was uh, kind of our charge in, in, in this world to um, keep that going. Um, we started back up in June in our, with our, um, our in-person exams. We took a lot of safety precautions to put that in place, uh, making sure um, um, we worked with the uh, local uh, facilities where we're at to, to make sure we actually had a, a safe um, environment. Um, we basically did everything on a week by, week by week basis. We actually had a um, kind of a, a crash tri triage team that met every week and looked at uh, coming weeks coming up and we basically canceled or, or basically greenlighted based on what we saw on the site and what was going on. And uh, um, we are still doing that now. Uh, so we've continued that um, from April all the way to, to uh, today and we're still doing those weeklies and, and making calls on whether or not we go live with uh, events or actually cancel those events. Um, at this time, we've actually moved a number of sites uh, that we're actually running to about 75% of what we actually normally would actually do. Um, but based on the uh, local regulations, we're still capacity is far, far below. Um, most of our sites were current capacity is um, well below 50% of what we normally do to make sure that we actually have proper spacing and, and, and protocols in place for, for the live events. Um, on the technology side, we had considered actually putting together um, some technology notifications for events and live events to to sign off on waivers and so forth as people came in each day to make sure that they actually didn't um, show any symptoms of COVID. We, we decided to keep that a little low tech because of the way we actually are structured with our instructors. Um, um, but it seems to have worked and surprisingly, um, um, part of our requirements for our attendees is that they actually do actually uh, um, become um, test positive for COVID within two weeks after our event, they have to actually notify us and we actually um, send out tracings back to our, to our individuals, our sites. And since June, uh, based on the number of sites we've actually done, which is um, um, uh, quite a few, um, we've only actually had two situations where we actually had to report back to the group um, that there might have been a possible um, um, exposure. Um, but there's been no, um, no follow-ups on that. 
exams. So we, uh, the number of exams we actually do is, um, as I mentioned, quite extensive, and we actually do a mix of paper-based exams and computer-based exams. Um, we've pretty much done everything we also possibly can, any kind of uh, knowledge-based exams, two computer-based exams um, done through a, uh, um, one of our partners. We actually use Perometric and their network to do um, on-site uh, um, testing through computer-based. There are some tests uh, we can't uh, quite move to computer-based yet. We'd have a lot of practical hands-on exams that require uh, physical specimens and tools um, um, to do our um, assessments. And those uh, um, are ones that we basically pretty much had to shut off in, in March, April, May. Domestically, we still had some sites um, globally, as, as we all know, um, um, a lot of shutdowns actually happen in waves throughout the, throughout the world. So we actually had still some areas um, which we're actually um, um, doing some activities in March, April, May, but in the U.S. We're, we were completely shut down. Um, again, just like the uh, in-course, in-person uh, in uh, seminars, we actually took safety precautions. Um, um, sanitizing the the tools and the, the specimens were the biggest concern. We actually had those events. Um, uh, we put those in place and it took us a while to actually get those in, in place. And a lot of, like uh, uh, many of you actually know, just getting access to the um, uh, to the supplies to do that was a was a major obstacle for actually to, to overcome before we actually can go uh, go live in June. Um, so we're uh, we're actually seeing norm, near normal activity as far as our prep courses, as far as our exams, uh, paper and computer based, and a lot of that has to do with our third party prep courses. Um, um, we have a lot of third party prep uh, partners out there who um, who also actually are, are helping us actually make sure people actually have options to. To get back, take their uh, their courses and, and, and get examined um, and get certified. Um, we did consider online proctoring of, of some of our exams um, to to um, keep people uh, have an alternate to actually maybe go to a site um, to do it. But uh, um, as I mentioned on the physical exam, there just there just was not enough time to actually transition that over. There's too many obstacles there. For the knowledge based exams, uh, we kind of uh, tracked with our partner for Magic about when they were coming back online. And, and, and as many of you actually know, um, we kind of mirrored what we did on our in person seminars and our, and our in person exams based on what ProMetric did as well. They came, they started to actually um, slowly ramp back in line in, in late summer as well, uh, keeping capacities low and, and, and having safety protocols in place as they actually slowly ramped back up. Um, so, uh, um, as you all as, as you all know, our certification programs have our uh, our assessments up front, uh, but we also have our renewals and recertifications. There was some concern that um, uh, the the impact of COVID econo economically um, on our certification pools would actually adversely affect our um, our renewals and our recertifications. Um, that was one concern, and and as you can tell by the slide you see up here. Um, that's not been the case. Um, we have a very optimistic certification group and, and uh, they seem to be actually um, um, determining that their certifications um, are as valued now as they were before um, and they expect them to be in the future. So we have not seen um, any uh, drop in our retention um, in our pools, um, which was uh, somewhat unexpected. We thought there might be a financial impact in that area, um, but there was not. Um, we were able to uh, give extensions where they seemed reasonable um, and possible uh, to a lot of our certification holders. Um, there are some areas where we're tied to um, to compliance on our certifications, and one of our big areas is our uh, our welder program. And um, uh, we're required to actually follow national codes on those um, programs. And uh, many of our own uh, standards and code bodies actually have requirements that we actually have to follow on that. And uh, that was actually a, um, a huge uh, win for our standards and our code groups in that area. Um, as you, many of you know, when you actually work and try to get a change through our standards or our code bodies, it can take some time to get that done. Um, our standards group very, very quickly got together all of our uh, code committees who actually affect our um, certification welder program, um, which I believe is over 20 different code committees very quickly got together, uh, talked about the impact of COVID on, on industries and, and the cert certification pool. And within, I believe, about 45 days, got about um, um, all but two, I believe, of the co committees, more than 20, I think, and all but two actually got came out with amendments within 40 days to actually extend um, their certification requirements an additional six months, which actually helped us out quite a bit.
Uh, online learning. So um, we actually have an extensive online learning um, portfolio um, that we actually put out there for um, for our uh, populations. Um, as many of you um, probably did as well in April, we actually saw a big spike um, in our online learning products, and and this is a kind of a mix of mix of um, activity here. Um, we actually did uh, reach out to a lot of schools who were actually um, um, kind of a challenge to close out their their uh, spring semesters and we actually gave a lot of comps of our online learning um, portfolios to those schools and then some simply came out and actually bought them before we actually got the comp program in place um, to close out the um, the year and uh, we usually gave a three month um, basically a three month free trial to get them through the, the summer period as well um, many of those individuals came back and actually signed on again in august and september um, but we didn't see a huge, huge jump in those areas um, like you might actually see in those areas. Um, and, and we came back and, and kind of uh, pondered to ourselves why we actually maybe didn't see a large increase in these these events. And we uh, we think maybe some virtual fatigue and maybe some um, movement to some other platforms might be the, uh, the reason for that. Uh, we did transition um, some new products out there um, very quickly. We have some pretty well. Um, during the uh, the factors of COVID and we actually in springtime. Also, uh, we're able to move some topics where we either had internal um, experts um, that they were, these were content areas that they could not write online with um, um, that gave an to, to look at the program again, say we really need to bring this online. So uh, our help group is uh, um, uh, um, very quickly. And this program actually managed to move over a lot of uh, person content. You only do one person to an online, to an platform online. There were two of over. A lot of these were a report of the campaign that we did. We actually had we actually have a lot of tools and a lot of assessments we actually do. We had to quickly ramp up actually data access, actually increase our inventories on all the equipment and basically turn around and, and put in place a uh, um, system to actually send that uh, send those specimen pulls out to individuals, and then a way to actually recover that uh, those specimens and tools from the uh, from our attendees um, and turn this back around to, to new to new individuals. And we got really um, good response from our customers. So while our in person events are actually were, were kind of limited to 50% capacity, um, those uh, individuals um, who actually were not able to actually go into those in person events. Or were unwilling to go into in-person events, were able to to kind of uh, toggle to these um, online learning events, which actually um, explains why our certification numbers are getting close to where they they were before. And the last item uh, I will actually talk about is our um, company certification or accreditation programs. Um, Chris did a great um, uh, presentation on this, which uh, um, I was very very interested in. Um, uh, while ASME um, and Chris spent a lot of time actually getting ready to do a virtual audits um, up into the COVID, and they actually laid out a great foundation. Um, we were a much, much smaller program. Um, where, where Chris, I think he runs around 20, maybe 25 or 30 audits per week based on the numbers I'm looking at. We do only about two or three, two or three a week. So we're a um, very much smaller program by, by magnitude of 10. Um, we had not uh, really looked uh, seriously at uh, virtual auditing and uh, uh, are now only um, at this point in the fourth quarter of this year looking at actually getting fourth um, auditing um, um, virtual auditing up in place and we're probably going to start with some of our our um, uh, probably smaller programs um, maybe less critical programs um, uh, kind of cut our teeth on those probably use a lot of what I've actually learned from from Chris's presentation to actually uh, to get those going um, and uh, um, and go from there uh, we did uh, do a lot of extensions on our um, accreditation, like Renee mentioned in his uh, his presentation, and we do actually have a backlog uh, going into 2021, like many uh, many of you might actually have who also run company certification programs. 